Despite what you may imagine, daily life for a king or a queen during the Middle Ages wasn't all about lounging around in robes of silk and satin and indulging in lots of feasts. Well, not just about that. In fact, living large as medieval royalty wasn't really all that great. So, today we're going to take a look at surprising ways your life is far more luxurious than kings from the Middle Ages. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel. After that, we'd be much obliged if you would leave a comment and let us know what other historical topics you would like to hear about. Okay, next stop, Medieval Times. The uh, time period, not the themed restaurant. Although, can we go to the restaurant? When you're a royalty, you typically get the best medical care available. The finest tonics, the strongest ointments, and the shiniest instruments for drilling the evil spirits out of your head. But in every era, there are some ailments that even the best medical care is unable to deal with. And in the medieval period, one of those conditions was the bubonic plague, also known as the Black Death. The Black Death was seriously dangerous to medieval peasants and monarchs alike. It didn't seem to give a plague rat's ass about wealth or status. When a massive outbreak swept through Europe in the mid-14th century, an estimated third of the continent's total population died. Things got so grisly that people were willing to try pretty much anything to cure the plague. For example, some people strapped live chickens around their swelling sores. Potions were a popular choice too, particularly if they were laced with what the makers called unicorn horn. Unicorns are fake, as you may have realized, so the actual ingredient was frequently something less exotic and more poisonous, like mercury or arsenic. Some healing beverages even included ground precious gems, like emeralds and sapphires. So you could look forward to chugging an extremely expensive plague shake if you were a royal touched by the Black Death's bony fingers. Of course, none of these treatments actually prevented the plague, and many of them just did more harm to the patients. Thankfully, modern medicine has treatments for the bubonic plague, and most of them don't involve rock milkshakes or live chickens. Dating is tough. Even with all our fancy apps and matching services, finding a suitable life partner can seem daunting, if not impossible. But as hard as swiping left through a sea of red flags can be, at least you get to pick who you ultimately date, let alone who you marry. Most medieval royals didn't have that choice. Royals typically married for political reasons, and their unions usually established treaties between their respective home countries in the process. And if that weren't enough to suck the romance out of any marriage, like an industrial shop vac, intermarriages between families over successive generations meant the royal spouses were often cousins. This presumably made the holidays weird. The church did try to prohibit marriages between cousins from happening until the 13th century, but in practice, that didn't really stop anyone. Most nobles simply either got a papal dispensation or just ignored the rules entirely, which is a thing you can do when you're royalty. Some of the most famous medieval kings and their spouses were cousins wed for diplomatic purposes. William the Conqueror and his wife Matilda of Flanders were distant relatives. The Pope forbade them from getting married, but Billy the Conk did it anyway, because he was the king and it wasn't like he was going to punish himself. Isabella of Castile, the famous queen who financed the voyages of Christopher Columbus, and her husband, Ferdinand of Aragon, were second cousins when they got married. In addition to being gross, the intermarrying of close relatives led to a lot of health complications within royal families, such as hemophilia. Back then, it was widely believed that royalty possessed the divine right of kings. But that holy ordination was more than just a rite. It was a touch, like the Stan Bush song. The so-called royal touch ascribed magical healing powers to a king or queen's hands. Commoners suffering from sickness would beg for the royals to lay hands on them and cure their ills. In particular, people with scrofula, a swelling of the lymph nodes in the neck, would request the royal's aid. Kings sometimes had to touch hundreds of sick individuals to dispense their powers, and we were still a few centuries away from hand sanitizer. So, whatever your plans are for today, we bet they're better than having to tickle hundreds of scrofulas. In fairness, the royals didn't always have to directly touch the afflicted. Sufferers could also reputedly be cured by touching coins that the royal family had handled, although they probably didn't let you keep the coin. 
One of the biggest accomplishments of the modern world is that most people can read. Globally, an estimated 86% of people over 15 years old have some degree of literacy. That means most of us have a pretty big leg up on the fussy old rulers of several hundred years ago. Obviously, not every medieval king was illiterate. But even amongst the upper classes, the literacy level was nowhere near that of modern times. After all, ministers and scribes could do all the hard work of reading and writing for them, so why bother to learn? If you get a cheeseburger every time you snap your fingers, you're not going to waste a lot of time learning how to grill. Furthermore, many households didn't deem it necessary to educate women, so royal ladies often couldn't read either. When it came to signing off on things, kings could typically mark their signatures with nothing more than a scratch of a pen, which on the plus side probably made it easy to forge their autographs on medieval memorabilia. Despite what some Disney cartoons may have you believe, being a medieval princess wasn't a particularly fun gig. Many women didn't get an education of any kind and weren't given much of a say when choosing their husbands. They also didn't have a very long wait for their royal wedding because in the medieval age, many young ladies were married off as soon as they hit puberty or even before. For example, Lady Margaret Buford, mother of the future King Henry VII, was married to Edmund Tudor when she was only 12 years old. By the age of 13, she was a widow and pregnant with her son. She lived an entire Shakespearean tragedy in one year. That's efficient. Eleanor of Castile was wed to King Edward I of England around age 13 or 14, which now isn't even old enough to run for school president. So yeah, not being a widowed mother by age 13 is a pretty big win for modern life. Between the lack of any significant form of birth control and the expectation to produce a whole bunch of heirs, women in the Middle Ages got pregnant quite often. Once a week, if possible, depending on the weather. Unfortunately, your odds of dying during childbirth were really, really high. Scholars debate the percentage of upper-class mothers who passed away while giving birth, but it might have been up to 15 or 20 percent. For infants, the mortality rate might have been anywhere from 8.5 to 19 percent. That's some hard luck for a baby. These rates have decreased dramatically since medieval times. For example, the most recent measurement of the maternal mortality ratio in the United States placed the number at just over 17 deaths per 100,000 births. And the infant mortality ratio is roughly 5 deaths per 1,000 births. So while modern medicine still doesn't have a perfect record, it's a no-brainer that it's better to be pregnant in today's world than back in castle times. There are some basic features of modern life that many of us take for granted, like M&Ms and commercial air travel. But one of the most underappreciated is probably modern plumbing, specifically toilets with running water. Having the option to relieve oneself in the comfort of your own home without effectively creating a smelly new roommate is a luxury that is criminally undervalued. During medieval times, royals who felt the call of nature in the middle of the night had to go to the bathroom in giant jugs called chamber pots. Predictably, these crude vessels stunk up the room until they were disposed of by servants in the morning. And if you're wondering how they were disposed of, well, chamber pot contents were typically just tossed out the window. And it wasn't unheard of for one to be dumped on the head of an unsuspecting person who just happened to be passing beneath the window at the wrong time. As described in the old English tale, the legend of the Dave Matthews Band tour bus. In fact, Marie Antoinette once allegedly had a chamber pot dumped on her by accident when she was at the Palace of Versailles. That's probably not the cake she had in mind. That being said, there were some alternatives to the chamber pot. The finest castles were equipped with what were called guard robes, which were stone or wooden seats positioned over a shaft leading to a pit. Basically, really tall porta potties. And like porta potties, these unsanitary toilets required emptying at regular intervals as well. Medieval castles are often portrayed as elegant and luxurious places, with roaring fires, fine tapestries, and cozy, elegant furniture. But the reality was very different. In truth, the average person would probably be more comfortable in a tiny studio apartment than a kingly castle. Because they were built mostly out of stone, castles were often extremely drafty. This meant that they were freezing in the winter, didn't retain heat, and typically dripped with dampness. 
To counter these effects of the weather, royals had to move from palace to palace throughout the year. Sort of like how some people sprint down to Florida every year, the minute the leaves start to change. And those fine tapestries weren't there as mere decorations. They were hung on the walls by a castle's inhabitants for insulation. While they helped keep out the draft a little, they didn't entirely solve the problem. And there generally weren't enough spare outlets to plug in a space heater. For most people in the modern era, a 40-hour work week is standard. And while many people do have to work a lot more than that, at some point, we all get to clock out and go home, or go to Chili's for half-price appetizers. But that's not how it was for medieval royals. Being a king was a round-the-clock job, at least for the hard-working ones. For proof, look no further than King Charles V of France, whose routine was recorded for posterity. He woke up at 6 a.m. and got dressed, then prayed with his chaplain, after which he attended mass. Huh, seems kind of redundant, seeing a way to free up an hour here, Chuck. Later, Charles met with his subjects, followed by his council. Charles finally had something to eat at 10 a.m., then received diplomats, nobles, and loads more people until the afternoon. At that point, he'd get some time to rest and hang out in the garden. But the whole thing started over at 6 a.m. the next morning. He basically had to wake up early, go to church twice, and then have meetings all day long. Charles V may have been the first person to coin the phrase, that meeting could have been an email. No, wait, that meeting could have been a scroll. So what do you think? Would you rather be a medieval king or a modern day average Joe? Let us know in the comments below and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from our weird history.